Good evening, I'm Judy Woodruff. On the News Hour tonight, President Trump is set to deliver his first State of the Union address before a nation deeply divided. Then the Trump administration decides not to implement new sanctions against Russia, but releases a list of rich, influential Russian businessmen sparking anger from the Kremlin. And dreamers in school, how educators are addressing the unique challenges of their immigrant students who came to the U.S. as children. We're still trying to rebuild that trust and let them know that it's okay to come to us, that we're not going to work against them and that we're not going to turn them in. All that and more on tonight's PBS NewsHour. President Trump speaks to Congress and the nation tonight on his view of the State of the Union. White House officials say that he will tout economic progress and call for bipartisan agreement on immigration. House Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy says Republicans hope for a strong message. The number one question I want the president to ask tonight to the American people, are you better off today than you were two years ago? Because I think that answer could be very strong to probably put partisanship aside and have other people start working with us so we can solve the other problems that are before us. Democrats, in turn, say the country is more divided than ever. And Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer says credit for economic progress should go to the last president. The president thinks our economic recovery is all thanks to him, when reality is that he owes a lot of it to Barack Obama. Two words I don't think we'll hear tonight on the economy. Thanks, Obama. Second, we expect to talk, the President to talk about bipartisanship. But throughout his time in office, he has failed to walk the walk. Massachusetts Congressman Joe Kennedy, grandson of the late Senator Robert F. Kennedy, will deliver the official Democratic response. And I'm joined now by White House correspondent Yamiche Alcindor and our Capitol Hill correspondent Lisa Desjardins for a look ahead to tonight's speech from both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue. Hello to both of you. Yamiche, you are outdoors. I'm going to go to you first. Uh, what are you hearing about what the president's going to say? Well, a White House official tells, tells me that the speech is going to be about 50 minutes and that several people worked on the speech, including H.R. McMaster, the National Security Advisor, Gary Cohn, the Chief Economic um, Advisor, Stephen Miller, as well as Vice President Mike Pence. The theme is supposed to be building a safe, strong, and proud America. He's supposed to be talking about several topics, including immigration, national security, jobs, infrastructure, and trade. And some of the guests that the White House is bringing is, is really going to bring home that point. They're talking, they're bringing people that have benefited from the Republican tax plan. They're also going to be bringing somebody who adopted uh, a child that was affected by the opioid crisis. And Yamish, you were telling us that it's notable what the president is not expected to talk about. The president is not expected to talk about some of the main issues that Americans are speaking about, and that is the Me Too movement and sexual harassment all across this country. He's also not supposed to be talking about the Russia investigation and Robert Mueller. Of course, there's been so many, um, so many reports out there that he might be trying to fire the special, in, in, in the special investigator. Um, that he's also not supposed to be talking about the spike in hate crimes. There's a lot of division in the country with race relations and people talking about that all the time. Um, but the president said in a lunch with me that me and you attended this afternoon that he wanted to that he wants to unify the country so it's going to be interesting to see whether or not he can do that he said that usually major events catastrophic events essentially are what bring Americans together but he wants to do that without having Americans suffer that's right and he also commented uh, at that lunch on uh, what he'd learned uh, as president about having it's important to have heart as well as being concerned about money which was an interesting comment lisa to you now this uh, state of the union address comes at a time of i guess you'd have to say some high stakes decisions yeah. that are about to be made uh, in congress are republicans looking to the president to help get some legislation they want passed done Absolutely, and I think that touches on the sort of strange dynamic I feel tonight. I've covered many State of the Union addresses, but this one, the drama is not the speech. The drama are the deadlines that Congress faces to pass an immigration bill in the Senate by next week. Also, to deal, have a budget deal, much less a president who seems to be at war to some degree with the FBI over a Russia investigation. Those things are day-to-day -day here at the Capitol. 
this is something that Republicans think will not be affected by the speech. What they want from this president is for him to be presidential, to be moderate, the things the White House indicates it's doing. So to some degree, Judy, expectations for Republicans are low to middle range. They're setting those expectations that way so that the president can overcome them. But this speech also presents a problem for Republicans, Judy. They have a real divide on immigration. Today, Representative Paul Gosar of Arizona asked the Capitol Police to ask for identification of every guest tonight. And if they find someone who is an undocumented immigrant here, as there will be many guests tonight, he has asked Capitol Police to remove them and arrest them. That is different from other Republicans, including Republican Carlos Curbelo, who has invited an undocumented dreamer, someone they have a status. But it, it shows the divide here for Republicans in this speech and time right now. Well, it'll be interesting to see what happens. And Lisa, what about the Democrats? We know uh, many of them are not uh, happy with this president. Some of them, I guess, are not planning to attend. Some of them are going to wear uh, various colors to show their uh, displeasure. What are they looking for? Well, take what Yamish told you about the things the president is not talking about, the Me Too movement, for example. Those are the things, and the Russia investigation, Russia sanctions, those are the things that Democrats are talking about today. Those are the things they're challenging him on. You will see a lot of Democrats, especially women, Nancy Pelosi wearing black tonight to support the Me Too movement. You will see red buttons. Those are for Reese Taylor. It's the woman that Oprah mentioned at the Golden Globes who was gang raped, African-American woman in the 1940s. It's sort of this idea of bringing up minority and women's issues is something you're going to see from Democrats tonight. Well, uh, both of you are going to be with us for the rest of the night, and we look forward to it. Thank you, Yamish and Lisa. Thanks. And in the day's other news, a major health care announcement triggered a significant sell-off on Wall Street. Health insurers, drug makers, and distributors were all hit hard after Amazon, Berkshire Hathaway, and J.P. Morgan Chase announced a new venture aimed at providing quality health care at a reasonable cost. The Dow Jones Industrial Average plunged 362 points, nearly 1.5 percent, to close below 26,077. The Nasdaq fell 64 points, and the S&P 500 lost 31. House Speaker Paul Ryan is defending an effort by congressional Republicans to make public a classified memo on the Russia probe. The House Intelligence Committee voted last night to take that step over the Justice Department's objections. Some Republicans say the memo shows improper surveillance by Justice and the FBI and an effort to conspire against President Trump. There may have been malfeasance at the FBI by certain individuals. So it is our job in conducting transparent oversight of the, of the executive branch to get to the bottom of that. Sunshine is the best disinfectant. And so we, what we want is all of this information to come out so that transparency can reign supreme and accountability can occur. President Trump has the final word on releasing the memo, and he has said he favors doing so. But the White House said today that it will run a legal and national security review before a final decision. The Trump administration will not implement new economic sanctions against Russia for now for interfering in the 2016 presidential election. The State Department said late Monday that existing measures are already working. But the Treasury Department published a list of Russian officials and wealthy businessmen who could be targeted. Today in Moscow, President Vladimir Putin called the list a hostile step. <laughs> What's the sense of these actions? I don't understand. But it is, of course, an unfriendly act. It complicates the already difficult situation in Russian-American relations and, of course, harms the international relations as a whole. It is complete stupidity to reduce our relations to zero. We'll take a closer look at all of this a little later in the program. The United Nations Children's Fund is warning that stepped-up sanctions on North Korea could mean nearly 60,000 children will starve. UNICEF says that the penalties are making it harder to ship food, fuel and medicine to the North. The sanctions target the North's nuclear and missile programs. The Taliban today condemned President Trump's rejection of truce talks in Afghanistan. Mr. Trump had cited a spate of deadly attacks. In a statement today, the Taliban said the U.S. strategy is simply more war. In Yemen, there is new trouble for a coalition led by Saudi Arabia against Shiite rebels linked to Iran. 
fighters who had been part of the coalition seized the port city of Aden today after two days of fighting. They surrounded the presidential palace and accused the Saudi-backed government of corruption. They also want a separate state in southern Yemen. Tens of thousands of Kenyans turned out today for the mock inauguration of opposition leader Raila Odinga as alternative president. President Uhuru Kenyatta won October's election after the opposition boycotted. Today, Odinga supporters swarmed in Nairobi Park as he took his oath and declared defiance of the government. Today is a historic day in our country of Kenya. For the first time, Kenyans have taken the decision to remove themselves from a dictatorship government that came through the stealing of votes. Kenya's government cut live transmission of three TV channels airing that event and branded it treason. Police also fired tear gas at demonstrators who were nearby. There is new fallout from Larry Nassar's sexual abuse of young women athletes. Texas will now investigate the Caroli Ranch Training Center, where some gymnasts say the former sports doctor molested them. Michigan State University is expected to name former Governor John Engler as interim president amid allegations that the school ignored Nassar's abuse there. And Congress agreed to mandate that athletic groups quickly report claims of abuse to the police. Volkswagen has suspended a top executive today after disclosures of diesel fume experiments using monkeys. Initial reports had said that humans were also used, but the executive now says that he rejected that idea. Instead, monkeys breathed in fumes for four hours to test emission controls. This follows the 2015 scandal over VW's cheating on emissions tests. And get set for a three-in-one lunar show early tomorrow. First, a blue moon, the second full moon in the same month. At the same time, it'll be a super moon, closer than usual, and appearing bigger and brighter. And finally, there will be a total lunar eclipse, but in only part of the country. It all happens before dawn Wednesday, mostly over the western U.S. and Asia. Still to come on the news hour, our preview of the State of the Union continues with Georgia Republican Senator David Perdue. A historical look at presidential speeches, plus why the U.S. government is publicly naming business people with close ties to Vladimir Putin, and much more. As we learn more about President Trump's speech and his plan to strike a bipartisan tone, I spoke with one of his closest allies in Congress, Republican Senator David Perdue of Georgia. And I started by asking what will be the president's main message tonight. Judy, I think we're going to see an upbeat and optimistic uh, president tonight like we saw in Davos last week, where he sent the world a message that America was open for business again and that America first did not mean necessarily America alone. So I think he's going to lay out his agenda from last year and the results that we are seeing, but also very carefully lay out and articulate his priorities for 2018. We know that he is going to talk about immigration, among other things. You have said um, that the president's proposal hits, I think you used the words, a sweet spot, that it's a middle ground. But as you know, the critics on the left say that it's too harsh in breaking families apart, that it spends too much on a border wall. Then you have critics on the right uh, saying that it's too, that it's unacceptable to give undocumented young immigrants a path to citizenship. How do you bring these two sides together? What the president did, Judy, was lay out a framework for our conversation here in Congress to finally, once and for all, deal with the DACA situation but make sure that we eliminate the causes of the situation in the first place. And that is that we have to deal with what created this chain or the family immigration system that we had since 1965. Actually, Tom Cotton and I put a bill in a year ago, uh, it's hard to believe it's been that long, but a year ago to actually move us toward what Bill Clinton wanted and, and uh, Barbara Jordan back in the 90s. And that is move us more toward a merit-based immigration system that protected the immediate family and these, this system is more like what Canada and Australia have been doing for decades. So you think the two sides are going to come together because right now they seem pretty implacably opposed. 
I think any time you have two parties like this opposing it the way that uh, they have been on the president's framework, it tells me that the president did hit that sweet spot that I was talking about. And we're going to find out on both sides, Judy, who's serious about solving this problem once and for all. 80% of America wants a secure border and a wall in places where it's necessary. Two-thirds of America want to solve the DACA problem, but only if you end chain migration and diversity lottery and protect the immediate workers' family at the same time providing for border security. Senator, we're told the president's also going to talk about the need for infrastructure building. He's going to call for a mix of government and private capital uh, to come together to repair roads and bridges and so forth. But we know that Senate Democratic leader Chuck Schumer, other Democrats, are saying to rely on private developers is going to leave out large chunks of the country, that it's going to lead to tolls and taxes in different local jurisdictions. It's going to lead to private developers having too much say over infrastructure. How do you respond? The truth of the matter is, Judy, with our debt, we've lost that, that option, frankly. The only way uh, Chuck Schumer is going to get that uh, financing done that way is more taxes, and we know what that does to the economy. We've got examples right now like Power Africa, where our U.S. Department of State invested $8 billion and attracted $48 billion and is going to bring power to Africa over the next decade in a public-private partnership. We have the same opportunities in the, in the United States. What the president is going to do tonight, I believe, is lay out his priorities, which will be focused on investments that will uh, yield returns by growing the economy. And in so doing, I think we'll find a way to pay for it. Uh, Senator, a different subject, and that is uh, Russia. Uh, we know that last night the State Department uh, announced that it is not going to impose sanctions on Russia that Congress overwhelmingly passed uh, in mid-2017. They say the legislation itself is enough of a deterrent. What's your view of that? Well, I think we've got to be very serious. Well, not only Russia, but North Korea, uh, Iran, and other nefarious actors around the world today. The world's more dangerous than any time in my lifetime anyway, and at the same time, we've got to rebuild our military. We're going to hear that tonight, specifically with regard to Russia. They need to know we're serious about messing with our election process. This is a democracy, and that won't be tolerated. Republicans and Democrats are aligned on that. I'm anxious to get these uh, intelligence committee's reports done, though. I think we need to get past this, get this in independent investigation over and done with. We've been doing this almost a year now, so it's time to get these results in and tell the American people where we are and build a defense against that uh, next activity. So are you all right with their not imposing the sanctions now on Russia? I, I voted for these sanctions. I think they should be employed, but I think it's part of a bigger picture. I'm, giving, I'm willing to give the Secretary of State and the President some latitude on this, Judy, only because it's part of a bigger equation with North Korea and China particularly right now, but also we're looking at the Iran nuclear deal to see how to hold that coalition together. There's no question that we need more serious sanctions against Iran and also North Korea, and I believe against Russia if they don't help us with North Korea. So the calculus here is, I believe, is Russia going to help us with North Korea? Are they going to uh, respond to this, um, this act by the president? And we'll see very, very quickly. Finally, Senator, I want to ask you about your constituents in Georgia. Uh, the Gallup organization came out with a poll. They've looked at all 50 states of the support uh, for the president over the past year on average. And in the state of Georgia, uh, which you represent, they said on average 41 percent of the people approve of the president's performance, 53 percent disapprove. How do you explain that? You know, that same poll had me losing by almost nine points, uh, Judy. I think I won by over eight points. I don't really put a lot of credit in that because this president does not fit the mold of the traditional Washington established president. He's an outsider. He's a business guy. I'm not worried about popularity polls. I'm worried about results like he is. And right now, his agenda is providing results. The work that we did on regulation last year, the work we did on energy and tax is producing results. Two and a half million new jobs were created last year. That is not lost on people in my state and across the country. Well, we are going to leave it there, and we're certainly all going to be watching the president. Senator David Perdue of Georgia, thank you. Thanks, Judy. Ahead of the president's address to Congress and the nation tonight, we spoke to people around the country about how they see the State of the Union. 
to walk us through how these Americans are grading President Trump and what their responses can tell us about this fall's congressional elections. I'm joined by Amy Walter of the Cook Political Report, no stranger to this program. <laughs> so, Amy, we're going to start with a video from a man named Austin uh, Erdman. He's a farmer from Stockton, California. He told us the president has done a good job in his first year, particularly on the issue of immigration. I believe it's unfair to grade the president at this time because his proposed policies have not yet been fully formed and implemented. I also believe that the president is on the right track in pursuing immigration policies that will defend and protect all American citizens and our democracy. I also believe that laws, rules, and regulations need to be implemented to secure our borders and to protect our citizens. And we need to implement strategic screening processes to ensure that best as possible that our law-abiding productive people enter our country legally so, Amy, uh, we know the president is expected to talk about immigration tonight. We know there's a big divide here in Washington about it. What are people out in the country saying? Well, Judy, the team here at PBS talked to about a dozen voters, and the issue of immigration came up more than any other. Not surprising. Americans are as polarized on this issue as we see members of Congress. What we saw... Um, there was someone who supported the president and also supported his position on immigration. We heard as well from a woman in Southern California named Sabrina. She too liked the idea of more border security, but like we saw here with Austin, she does want to see more than just border security. She said she likes that the president's protecting illegal immigrants from taking resources away from American citizens. So it goes beyond just having money for the wall that the president talked so much about in 2016. But when you heard from the people who don't approve of the job the president's doing, particularly voters of color, they mm. see what the president's doing, they cite immigration as one of the main reasons they say that they disapprove of the job that he's doing. Talk to a woman named Blanche from Houston. She says that Trump's being unfair to immigrants. Another woman, Charlita from Cleveland, said it's not right what the president's doing to kick people out of the country that have been here for years. So. We are seeing yeah. the, the, the reason I think Congress is as polarized as it is, and is in part because voters are too. Because the country is polarized right. too. So now one of the other themes uh, you heard about in talking to voters was this concern about the president's temperament and some of the controversial comments that he's been making right. on Twitter. So we're going to hear now from a woman in Cincinnati. Her name is Sarah Warner. She was a reluctant supporter of Hillary Clinton, but now she says she disapproves of the job President Trump has done in office, but her concerns are bigger than just the president. We are so divided right now um, because we can't get over him. He's not the problem. He's a symptom of the problem. The problem is that our system is broken. People on either side of the argument are angry because they want change. We're not seeing that. We're looking for it, but we're not seeing it. No one really likes him. Like, no one. Come on. Think about it. Do you really want that representing your country? No. But it's our complacency that's the problem. So what you going to do about it? So, Amy, she's clearly not a fan of the president. Um, but what are you hearing about the president's temperament from people who like President Trump? Well, across the board, and Judy, we've been talking about this pretty consistently from the beginning of his presidency, that even people who say they like him, they voted for him, boy, I wish he'd get off Twitter. Boy, I wish he would sort of... Go, uh, sort of dial it back on his rhetoric and his behavior. But for people who dislike him, it's much more, it says much more about him uh, that than just his behavior, but that they believe that it's dangerous, right? That what he's doing is more than just having a personality issue that they have a problem with. There's a woman, Janet, from Davenport, Iowa. She says she thinks he threatens freedom of speech with his attacks on the media. She calls him dishonest, an embarrassment. Um, but even those who are happy with him, right. we saw, we have one interview with the man from Nevada who said, I love what he's doing for the courts. I love that he's putting conservative jurists on there, but he keeps getting in his own way. And he said, if he didn't do that, if he didn't have these self-inflicted wounds, he'd be as perfect as he could be. 
Wow. So, and we and we know the president tells everybody who will listen that if he can, that as long as he can, he's going to stick with social media because that's his way of of fighting back against against the press that he thinks is overwhelmingly against him. So now, one thing, Amy, we have talked about this past year is the president thinks the economy's doing better and better, and that he deserves a lot of the credit for that. Uh, low unemployment, uh, tax cuts, just the uh, st overall strong economy. How do people see that? You know. It's interesting, Drew, because what we saw when talking to voters is that for those who supported the president, they cited the economy as a reason for supporting him. There is a truck driver that we talked to, Aaron from St. Louis. He said, my 401k is going through the roof. And you know what? I think these tax cuts are going to help me because my company that runs this trucking uh, organization, they are probably not going to lay anybody off because they're going to have more money. When you talk to folks who disapprove of the president, they don't talk about the economy. What they talk about is the tax cuts that they believe are going to help corporations and hurt regular people. One woman from Iowa said, I think they're just helping corporate farmers, not small farmers. But Judy, I think the person that really sums up really what 2018 is going to be, who sums up the tension, really, of 2018, is a man named Todd from Houston. He thinks the economy is doing well, but he really dislikes the president's behavior and what it has done for the country, especially the div divisiveness it's sown in the country. And we're going to watch throughout 2018 how voters grapple with that. I feel better about the economy. I don't feel good about the president. Which one of those things is going to win out? So last question, was there anything that you expected people to bring up that they didn't uh, talk about? There was not one word about Russia. There was not one word about investigations. Mm -hmm. There wasn't anything about impeachment. It was really focused on the president's behavior almost more than anything else. And we've been talking about this forever, right? Sure. It's his personality more than his policy that defines him. But the economy we expected, immigration we expected. But given the amount of time that is given to the Russia investigation and energy, especially in this town, um, no one uh, to see that nobody even in passing brought it up was interesting. But you are right; it is getting an enormous amount of attention yes. in the news media right now. So that is a particularly interesting thing that they didn't bring it up. Amy Walter, Cook Political Report. Thank you, and you're going to be with us for the rest of tonight, all night, to talk about the State of the Union. Yes. Thank you. And now we step back for a historical perspective on addresses to the nation. The State of the Union is an uninterrupted opportunity for President Trump to outline his legislative agenda and his priorities. To help us understand the potential significance of tonight, I'm joined by presidential historian Michael Beschloss. Michael Beschloss, welcome back to the program. It's good to see you. you. So a lot of eyes Thank on you. the president tonight. What sort of opportunity does the State of the Union present? Well, it's the it's most suited if you've got a president who's got something new, wants to tell the country, I want to move in a different direction. For instance, 1941, in January, Franklin Roosevelt talked about the four freedoms that he wanted to see around the world. What that told Americans was, this is a president who really is a lot more likely to want to get involved in World War II against Hitler than we expected. Lyndon Johnson in 64 and 65 said, I want a war on poverty. I want to go for civil rights and voting rights. Uh, George W. Bush in 2002 talked about the axis of evil, what we should do to worry about North Korea, Iran, Iraq. Look how much that has affected world history ever since then. That's the best opportunity for a president in this situation. So, Michael, do, do the, the words a president speaks at a State of the Union or other important address, do they actually have the ability to move legislation, to get people behind him uh, for whatever he wants to get done? If they give a great speech, for instance, Lyndon Johnson in 1964, he really felt in his heart about poverty. He helped to tell Americans this is a disgrace that in this prosperous country there's so many uh, people who are suffering. That got Americans to lean on their members of Congress to move. Well, you also have, uh, I mean, it's part of what we're all talking about tonight, you have a non-traditional president. Uh, in Donald Indeed. Trump, but in a very traditional setting, making this speech, State of the Union, standing before the Congress. Is there any historical precedent? Well, the interesting thing, there is not, and especially because you've got a president who basically says, is proud of the fact 
uh, much as it grieves me to say this, Judy, he says he's not very interested in history and doesn't read books. So this is very different from most presidents who study how other presidents have used this occasion. And so, you know, if you think, is this a, someone who's going to write a speech, stick, stick to it, and not get off the teleprompter, he probably will get off the teleprompter, and that could be the news of the night. It's interesting because, as, as we know, Michael, there's so much focus right now on the president's, what, how the president uses social media, what he says right. in his tweets, and in his, especially, and in his other off-the-cuff remarks. So when you weigh a speech versus the off-the-cuff, you really are looking at a different, uh, a different way of getting a message out. That's right, and this is a reality TV star, and he knows that people are usually more interested in what seems to be spontaneous than what is on script. And also, he famously does not have a lot of self-discipline. He gave a somewhat unifying, rather polished speech off the teleprompter to Congress last year, was widely praised for it, and as you remember, very quickly after that, did a tweet about Barack Obama supposedly uh, bugging Trump Tower that sort of stamped on his message. And, and finally, Michael, I, I guess picking up on that, the, this is a moment when there is this investigative cloud hanging over uh, the president. Um, is this a moment to shake that loose, or how do, how do people see a president at a moment like this? Well, Donald Trump has got two historical choices. 1974, Richard Nixon went before Congress and said, time to uh, end the Watergate investigation. He said, one year of Watergate is enough. Twenty years ago, uh, in 1998, Bill Clinton, just after the Monica Lewinsky episode began, went before Congress, gives this long speech about 90 minutes. People kept on waiting to hear what he was going to say about the scandal. He didn't say a word. And as a result, Clinton's public approval rating, as measured by the mm -hmm. Gallup poll, went up 10 points from 59 to 69. So we'll see which course the president chooses. And we're hearing tonight the president does not plan to mention the Russia investigation. So we will be watching. Michael Beschloss, thank you and very much. Thank you so much, Judy. Stay with us coming up on the News Hour. How a community in Ohio is responding to the opioid epidemic and teachers' efforts to support so called dreamers. But first, we return to the Trump administration's policy toward Russia. John Yang has more on that and a look ahead to the upcoming presidential election there. Judy, last summer, Congress overwhelmingly voted to sanction Russia for meddling in the 2016 U.S. elections. Last night, the Trump administration said it is not imposing any of those sanctions because the threat of them is enough. The measure also directed the Treasury Department to compile a list of Russian senior political leaders, heads of state-controlled industries, and oligarchs worth more than a billion dollars in an effort to name and shame them. Last night, the, the uh, Treasury Department sent Congress a list of more than 200 names. It includes Russian Prime Minister and former President Dmitry Medvedev, Igor Sech Sechin, the chief of Rosneft, a Russian energy giant. He is also part of President Putin's inner circle. And Oleg Derek Paska, a billionaire aluminum magnet with alleged ties to corporate, uh, sorry, to organized crime. He's also the business partner, or was the business partner, of now indicted and former Trump campaign chairman Paul Manafort. Joining us now to talk all about this is Andrew Weiss. He worked for both Republican and Democratic administrations as a staffer on the National Security Council and in the State and Defense Departments. He is now at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Andrew, thanks for being here. But let's begin with this list. What's the point of it? They, they, they were, uh, Treasury Department was careful to say no one on this list is being sanctioned. So why did Congress want to draw it up and what does being on that list mean? Well, you said a second ago that the core of the sanctions bill, which was approved last summer, was basically to tie the hands of the administration and to make sure that there would be no precipitous 
effort by the new administration to basically take the heat off of Vladimir Putin for what he's done in Ukraine, what he's doing in Syria, what he did in our election. As an added sort of in attempt to kind of needle this administration and to do whatever they could to create so much sort of negative valence around Russia's business and government figures, they said, compile a list and show us how dirty these people are. That was not something that the administration was enthusiastic about. They've resisted this entire sanctions bill tooth and nail. And then when the time came to finally deliver the report to Congress, they basically said, here's a list that we've cut and pasted out of, uh, basically out of open sources to make the effect as, as little, limited as possible. You say that they've, they've fought this uh, sanctions bill tooth and nail. Last, yesterday, the State Department said that the threat of sanctions was deterrence enough uh, against this, uh, the Russians for meddling in the elections. But then Mike Pompeo, the CIA director, said they are already trying to meddle in the 2018 elections. So how, what, what's, what do you take, what's your response there? What do you, how do you take that? Well, dysfunction and incoherence are now the norm in the Trump administration's foreign policy. So the fact that you have basically an administration where no one really trusts them on Russia policy, people basically hear what Donald Trump says, he talks continuously, including last week, about the possibility of a new reset with the Russians. He continues to exaggerate Russia's relevance for our foreign policy agenda. And then you have people down below inside the bureaucracy who want to show that they're tough and who want to show that Russia's behavior have will have consequences. You can't combine those two approaches. How is this being interpreted in Russia? Well, right now, Russia is in a pre-election frenzy. And so for Vladimir Putin to be able to say, see, the United States is targeting us, they want to bring us back to where we were at our low point in the 1990s. Today, when Vladimir Putin was speaking on Russian television, he said, all 146 million Russians are on this list. So what he's trying to do is a classic strategy. He's done this consistently over the last 18 years in power of saying, the West is against us, and if we rally behind me, I will keep Russia strong. So in many ways, we play into his hands. The first round is March 18th. He's saying that this is an example of the United States trying to meddle in the Russian election. Right, and that, you know, to me, has zero credibility. And I mean, you know, a former president of Estonia joked today, I don't know what's funnier, the sanctions being as empty as they are, are you claiming you have an election. And also, what's going on with uh, the, the, the sort of, is this trying to, an effort on, on Vladimir, Vladimir Putin to, to, to boost the turnout, to try to really get a big, uh, look like a, a huge mandate out of this election? That's where the Kremlin is, I think, legitimately worried. The lack of any real competitive political process, the lack of any drama about this election, has basically put most of the Russian body politic into a snooze mode. And there's very little to get them excited enough to return Vladimir Putin for his presumably far, fourth and final term with a big turnout or a big boost. So at this point, there's you know, mostly inertia, apathy, and lack of alternatives that's cementing his rule. And is the opposition trying to... to get turnout down? Yeah, so on Sunday, there were demonstrations across Russia convened by the Russian opposition leader, uh, Alexei Navalny, who's calling for a boycott of the election. The Kremlin's clearly very concerned about that and is doing whatever it can to push him basically out of the news. Andrew Weiss at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Thanks for helping us understand this. Thank you. When a county in southern Ohio saw a sharp spike in the number of fatal opioid-related overdoses, they responded by forming PORT, the post-overdose response team. Esther Honig of Side Effects, which is a public media project, reports on how Ross County, Ohio, has enlisted local law enforcement, addiction treatment services, and the health department to work together and help curb overdoses. The treatment people would be really good. Every Wednesday morning in Chillicothe, Ohio, this overdose task force meets. There's a police officer, a sheriff's deputy, and a social worker from a local addiction treatment center. The group sets out to follow up with each person in Ross County who overdosed the week before. Their mission? Get them into treatment. The program started after a string of fatal overdoses in 2016, and county leaders came together to find a solution. Out of the meetings came a uh, decision that we needed some type of team to go out and speak with people that have overdosed, either their families or both family and the overdose victim. And somebody named it PORT, which is a post-overdose response team. PORT allows law enforcement to take on the role of a social worker. They talk to residents about addiction and help them find treatment, even if that means driving them to facilities out of state when there's nothing available in their area. 
Today, the team follows up with just four overdoses. In the past, they've had as many as 20. I just like to come in one day, we don't have any. At their first stop, resident Chad Lurdy is shocked when the port team tells him his friend struggles with addiction. I think very highly of him and, and my heart's broke. I had no idea he had a problem. Recently, Port began offering training on how to use the overdose reversal drug naloxone, also known as Narcan. Dave Weber, one of the, the, the deputies, said that you're in a position to, to be really helpful in this situation. Um, I'll try. I mean, I don't want to see anybody die. And you think you might go through the Narcan training? I'm going to, I'm going to very seriously consider that. Here in Ross County, the rate of fatal opioid-related overdoses is nearly double the national average and one of the highest in the state. Now, Port, with a relatively small budget, has managed to get people the resources they need in time to hopefully prevent more of these overdoses from happening. Still, not everyone supports what they do. We have some people that are upset that we give Narcan. You know, they, they say that this, it was this person's choice to do it, you know, but we kind of, you know, we don't, we don't buy that. My, my response to them is, what if it were your son, daughter, or wife, or husband laying there on the ground? Would you want us to turn around and walk away? You guys need to go to them because these people are not in a situation where they can necessarily seek out right, for right. themselves. Right, right. Yep. When we first get there, they're, they're reluctant to speak with us. We explain what we're there for, and we're not going to arrest them. We're not there in a law enforcement capacity. And, you know, most of them open up and talk to us. Jessica Lutz overdosed at a store with her daughters. She remembers when the port team came to her door a few days later. My doorbell rang and I was scared to death because here comes my mom, like there's an officer and a woman at your front door and you know, you, you know they wanna to talk to you. And I walked out there and the officer said, he said, I'm not here to arrest you. I'm just here to make sure she's okay. She would just like to talk to you. And I met Tracy Hathaway. The social worker, who was also a recovering addict, convinced Jessica that there were resources that would help her get clean. There is hope that people can recover. She was doing it. There was this place of people that are doing it all the time that I did not know existed. You know, all these recovery places that we don't hear about. Port got Jessica into outpatient care immediately and after a month, a bed at a nearby recovery center. That's really cute. Right now, there are only a few programs like this in Ohio, but local lawmakers recently put aside over a million dollars to be able to replicate port in cities across the state. And the stakes are higher than ever. Each day, more than 142 people in the U.S. die from a drug overdose. That's more than the number of people who die from gun violence and car accidents combined. It's something that Jessica doesn't take for granted. She came home from rehab and credits port with having saved her life. Just to have that conversation after something like that happens, I and mean, no matter who you are, that's so scary. We don't want to die. We just don't know how not to use. And to find somebody that understands that and knows that we don't want to wake up and do these things every day. We don't, there's no pleasure in what we have to go through each and every day. Just to listen to that conversation and know that it really can happen is what changed everything for me. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Esther Honig in Chillicothe, Ohio. <laughs>The deadline to work out an immigration agreement is a little more than a week away. One of the key dividing lines, what to do about DREAMers. President Trump has said he plans to scrap the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program known as DACA this spring unless a deal can be worked out. In California and other states, teachers are on the front lines and student anxiety is on the rise. We have a story from one of our student reporting labs. It's reported by Fernando Cienfuegos. He's a junior at Northview High School in Southern California. It's for our weekly segment, Making the Grade. When DACA got rescinded, I didn't really know where to go. It was, it was just a very numb feeling. Paulina is a recent Northview High School graduate and DACA recipient. She attends Mount San Antonio Community College. She says her high school teachers were critical in helping her get there. They outlined the steps she had to take as an undocumented student to get to graduation. If I didn't have Ms. Arianes, I think I would not have been as inspired to continue. 
on my education. She would constantly give me paperwork and paperwork about Dream, the Dream Act, Dreamers Financial Aid, and that was very, very helpful because I didn't know where else to get that information. Just the immense amount of belief they had in me. Are you going to mention why you just began working this year? I just started working this year because I barely got my DACA this year, so I'm just... But you're not going to put in the statement you want me to Yamina put Yamina Arianes teaches yes. economics and provides that, college uh, advising at Northview High School in Covina, California. She is one of a growing number of educators who independently sought training to support undocumented students. What motivated me to help undocumented students here at Northview was actually seeing the need. They really didn't know where to go. The Trump administration's approach towards immigration actually scares some students. They've got a, a, a deep-seated struggle going on within them because as hard as they work and as much as they want to be educated, they have this fear inside that perhaps within the next few years, no matter how educated they are, they might be removed from this country. We're still trying to rebuild that trust and let them know that it's okay to come to us, that we're not going to work against them and that we're not going to turn them in. An estimated 271,000 undocumented students are enrolled in the California K-12 public school system, the largest number in the country according to the Migration Policy Institute. In 1982, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that undocumented children have the right to a public education. Immigration advocates say that these students are a special needs group who would benefit from schools providing counseling, legal advice, and federal immigration policy information to their student body. Claremont graduate university professor William Perez studies the social and psychological development of immigrant students. He says teachers need tools. They're in desperate need of information about all the legislation. Teachers go online and they'll Google things or, you know, they'll find out about webinars or they'll find out about something that, you know, where they can go and sort of educate themselves. But, you know, it's being done in a very unsystematic way. Dr. Perez has launched the nation's first Allies to Dreamers certificate program. The course trains educators how to support undocumented students transitioning to college and into the workforce. Teachers need to be well equipped to be able to, you know, be responsive to their students. Despite supporting undocumented students, some conservatives, like Santa Ana school board member Cecilia Iglesias, believe academics should be the focus. You know, Santa Ana traditionally, historically, we have been underperforming, which means failing our kids. And uh, in the past 10 years, we have been on program improvement. And those are the things we should be talking about. That's why we were elected. If we wanted to go into be affecting immigration policy, we should go into Congress. Politics should never come into when it comes to education. Still, <laughs> teachers like Yamina Ariana say more must be done. I wish that the district would really work to educate our teachers, perhaps bring in some guest speakers of students who have graduated and have succeeded, who were undocumented, so that everybody can see that our kids and other kids that are undocumented, they make it. They make it if they have the support from the adults. For the PBS NewsHour's Student Reporting Labs, I'm Fernando Cienfuegos in Covina, California. Now to the NewsHour Bookshelf. So when do you work best? Are you a night owl or an early bird? Jeffrey Brown explores these questions with author Daniel Pink. There are plenty of how-to books out there. Now comes a when-to, the best time of day to take an exam, say, or have a medical procedure. And big life decisions, getting married, getting divorced, quitting a job. The book is titled When, The Scientific Secrets of Perfect Timing. And author Daniel Pink joins me now. Dan, hello. Hello, Jeff. Let me start with a when question for you. When did you get interested in, in this and, uh, and why? Well, I realized that I was making all kinds of when decisions myself. So things like when in the day should I exercise? When should I abandon a project that's not working? And I was making them in a pretty haphazard way. I figured I could make them in a better way. And I started looking at this research and there's a mountain of research out there uh, across many, many domains that allow us to make 
evidence-based, systematically smarter, shrewder decisions about when to do things. Smarter, shrewder, you, that's, that subtitle science, right? Sure. So that's the data that you're looking oh, at. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And it's data that comes in the field of economics, social psychology, but also cognitive science, anesthesiology, endocrinology. There's a whole field of chronobiology. Linguistics gives us some clues. So it's this research is all over the place. But in these different disciplines, they're asking very, very similar questions. All right. So daily routines sure. first. You're teasing out some of the, the patterns of our lives. Well, what it shows is that both our mood and our performance follow a fairly regular pattern across a day. So we usually have a peak, a trough, in a rebound. So our peak for most people is in the morning. Mm -hmm. We have a trough in the early afternoon and then we have this rebound recovery period later in the day. Now, for people who are night owls, they go through it in the reverse order. But what, what the research tells us is that we should be doing our analytic work, our heads yeah. down, lockdown work during the peak. During the trough, it's not good for very much. We should be doing our, we should be avoiding going into the hospital and answering our routine email. Yeah. And then during the recovery, we have an elevated mood, but we're less vigilant than during the peak, and that makes it a very good time for things like brainstorming and other kinds of creative work. And just moving our work just a little bit mm -hmm. can make a big difference. There's research showing that time of day explains about 20% of the variance in human performance on workplace tasks. So. Mm -hmm. Timing isn't everything, but it's a big thing. So the important thing is knowing who you are in a sense, right? Yeah. Some of us have what are called early chronotypes, where yeah. larks get up early, go to sleep early. Some people have evening chronotypes, owls, go to sleep late, wake up late. Most of us are kind of in the middle, what I call yeah. third birds. But the people who are larks and third birds peak, trough, recovery fairly predictably. The people who are owls, recovery, trough, Peak, I mean, there, there's so much there's so much fun to reading this, and then there's the scary things like, don't go have a medical procedure in the afternoon. That's not a good idea. That is really not a good idea. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of alarming if you look at some of the research. Uh, anesthesia errors four times more likely at 3 p.m. than at 9 a.m. Uh, endoscopists find half as many polyps and routine colonoscopies in afternoon yeah. exams versus morning exams. F nurses less likely to wash their hands. Physicians more likely to prescribe unnecessary antibiotics in the afternoon. Yeah. So spe speaking of afternoon, taking breaks is clearly breaking up the day, which leads to the question of naps, for example. Everybody's familiar with that. But not just the, you're not talking just about taking a nap, but very specific amounts of time, right? Yeah. There's, the research on naps shows that naps are actually pretty good for us. I'm a convert on this in that any time I took a nap myself, I would always wake up feeling both groggy and deeply ashamed of myself <laughs> <And> so, <laughs> for being so lazy. And it turns out I was doing it wrong. The ideal we, nap. We don't have the siesta idea in our No, culture. not at all. No, I have both the hyper puritanical and hyper masculine approach to things, <laughs> which is a toxic mix. But um, what we know about naps is that 10 to 20 minutes is actually the ideal time to take a nap. You get all of the benefits of a nap. I think of naps as Zambonis for our brains. They basically mm -hmm. smooth out the nicks on our mental ice, mm -hmm. um, but without any of what's called sleep inertia. Yeah. And the ideal nap is, is something called the nappuccino, where you have a cup of coffee first, set your alarm for maybe 25 minutes, take a nap. Uh, by the time you wake up, the caffeine will be hitting your body. Yeah, I read this, and this one really hit it me. Works. I did, I, it works. Drink the coffee, then take the 20-minute nap. Right. Okay. Now, at the end of every chapter, you have what you call the Time Hacker's Handbook. Right. And you are really giving people tips. You sure. think it's practical enough that we can change our lives. Absolutely. Yeah. You can't, I don't think you can transform your life. If you are overweight and lazy, changing your approach to time isn't going to convert you in that yeah. way. But what I'm trying to do here is that there's some really amazing science out there that gives us insights into who we are. But I find that if you can take some of that science and put it into place in your own life, um, it's, it's meaningful and you understand the science better. So have you changed your own life oh. around time? Oh, absolutely. So I, I'm a convert on breaks. I always write down two breaks in the afternoon that I'm going to take. I make yeah. a break list. Um, I've also been a convert on uh, good news and bad news. I always gave the, the good news first because right. I wanted to be a nice guy. But what you really want to do is give the bad news first and on that elevation. That's one of the things that endings do for us. So I have become not only a break taker, but the king of delivering bad news first. <laughs> <laughs> the book is When the Scientific Secrets of Perfect Timing. Dan Ping, thanks so much. My pleasure. Fascinating. I'm getting that book online right now.
you can read something else, and that is about the famous Mississippi prison that became a haunted setting in Jesmyn Ward's National Book Award winning 2017 novel, Sing Unburied Sing. Plus, tomorrow on the News Hour, we'll speak to Jesmyn Ward as part of our new book club in partnership with the New York Times. Now, read this. And that is the news hour for now. Please join us tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern for special live coverage of President Trump's first State of the Union address. Early excerpts show that Mr. Trump will call on Democrats to work with him and Republicans on immigration and infrastructure. Follow along online for additional analysis. I'm Judy Woodruff. For all of us at the PBS News Hour, thank you, and we'll see you soon. You're watching PBS.